Uh, dear students, my name is Andriy Sikhutov and I'm an associate professor here at the Department of Applied Analysis of International Problems and I also had a new founded laboratory of, uh, in English it is, Analysis of International Problems. And with me, I have today a distinguished professor of the Dartmouth College, uh, Dr. William Wolford, who also a scientific advisor ahead of the project with the newly established laboratory. Um, I see here in the audience students from both of my courses in Russian and in English, so you know Professor Wolford by his publication. Some of you know him very good because you have reported on his publication and, and did it well. So for those of you who don't have this um, uh, wonderful opportunity to get from the major pieces that I write in my course, I show you uh, Professor Wolford is one of the distinguished American scholars in the field of theory of international politics. He actually the founding father, or the father, of one of the branches of the realist theory and uh, is participating in the international debate, the theoretical debate, on uh, the current stage of development of the international relations theory. And his version of uh, realism, neoclassical realism, is basically one of the most productive and uh, I think um, uh, it is in, in many ways uh, why, say, we here in Russia, and particularly in Gimo, have an affinity with this branch of realism? It corresponds with the very natural uh, assessments that Russian foreign policy has on many things regarding international affairs. Uh, I, I mean, in particular, uh, the, uh, that the states are the central figures in the international life, that the balance of power is important, that the resources each state has are of acute importance, and that the logic of international process is mostly conflict. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Wolford is one of the most cited uh, professionals in this field. His uh, famous paper, Stability of the Unipolar World, is one of the most cited papers in this field. I think you have a genius record on this. If, if not yet, I think it, it, it will come. And uh, yesterday we had a brilliant conversation at the Valdai Club where uh, some of the bright Russian analysts tried to attack <coughs> the logic behind this article. And I think this is this very long and ongoing debate will still be there for some time. And it's a great opportunity for Mgimo to have Professor Wolford with us for the next three years, actually. He will be here from time to time on occasions visiting us and consulting with the laboratory. And we hope to have uh, uh, several of the lectures uh, that we can produce for student community at our campus. And it's a great opportunity for, for, for all of us to um, get his insights about the current state of affairs in international relations theory. Today in particular, Dr. Wolford will speak about the forecasting and international relations theory, how the two things correspond. We asked him to speak about this not only because this is uh, the topic which is connected to the project that we have in our laboratory, but it is also a very uh, important topic in terms of the teaching. At the second or third lecture in both of my classes, we have a class about on the relevance of theory. And we ask ourselves a question. Why theory is necessary? Do we actually need a theory to understand international politics? Do we actually need, and particularly to forecast, why theory is applicable? And uh, that's why we actually asked Dr. Wolkov to uh, speak today with us about this. And it's a great <coughs> pleasure and privilege to have you today with us. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. Is the, is my, am I audible to everybody in this room? I didn't, didn't have a pretty loud voice, so I usually don't require any amplification. Andre, thank you so much for that, uh, for that introduction. I really appreciate it. It's a great pleasure to be back here at M. Guimont, and I'm really happy to be working with the project of really superb scholars and experts here on, um, on a three-year-long project, as Andre mentioned. That's, I have no doubt whatsoever that highly cited and influential academic papers will emerge from this project. I will have a very slight role in this. The main uh, responsibility for it will be uh, for the experts here at MGMO to produce this work, but I'll do what I can to help them. It is a, uh, I'm very happy to see such a large crowd to hear. I'm very impressed. Maybe your professors made you come here who are students because the subject of IR theory is not always the most popular one. I taught for a long time at Georgetown University's master's program 
in uh, 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 foreign service, and I taught at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, and um, I had a hard time getting my master students interested in theory. So to see you all here is really, uh, a, really um, uh, uh, a great pleasure. I'll do my best to make this as interesting as possible, but I am going to take seriously Andres' request that I actually deal with the subject of international relations theory and forecasting. Come on in. So, uh, so, um, uh, w while, while, our final, while our guests are coming in, I can tell you a little bit about my own intellectual history. I'm rather old. I'm pushing almost 60 years old. I got my PhD and studied international relations during the Cold War. I spent uh, many years as an undergraduate and a graduate student studying two major subjects. International relations, IR theory in particular, and what was then called Sovietology the study of the Soviet Union and Soviet-type societies. And uh, I want to tell you the date that I graduated with my PhD. It was the spring of 1989. Now, those of you with historical memory may know that in the years and months after I graduated from Yale University with a PhD in Sovietology and International Relations Theory, two really big things happened. One of them was the end of the Cold War, and the other one was the collapse of the Soviet Union. I want to tell you that the work that I read, that I mastered, that I spent six years immersed in, not only did not predict these events, not only did not forecast these events, but led you to expect the opposite of what occurred. And so you might think, with that intellectual background, I'm going to come before you and tell you that basically theory is a waste of time, and, and you should just immerse yourself in the policy details and forget about all of the stuff that your professors are telling you about theory, because look what happened to me. I wrote an entire dissertation, and then the Soviet Union collapsed in front of me. Very disappointed. Well, Putin wasn't the only one disappointed. Uh, you know, this thing ruined a lot of stuff that I had to say. I had to take a dissertation and turn it into a history thing. So at any rate, uh, the bottom line is, um, uh, I actually am not as pessimistic about the utility of theory and the role of theory in forecasting as that intellectual biography might lead you to suspect. My main argument that I want to make to you today is that theory is actually necessary for forecasting, but that good forecasting requires a very eclectic approach. It requires that you not be entirely wedded to your theory. It requires that you not be a partisan or a extremist in your affection, affection for your theory. If you have a pragmatic attitude towards theory, I believe that its utility in forecasting will be significant. If you become a overly partisan, if you are rooting for your theory like you root for a football team, then you're going to run into problems in your forecasting. And what I want to do here is is, is talk about the following things. I'm going to tell you exactly where I'm going in my remarks. Uh, so if you'll bear with me, I'll give you kind of like the roadmap of where we're going. The first thing I want to talk to you about is how to think about forecasting. What's a good forecast or a bad forecast? Then I want to talk to you a little bit about current research, cutting edge social scientific research in the area of forecasting and what lessons emerge from that. And then I'm going to walk you through three examples of international relations theory and forecasting. I'm going to talk about events that are dear to my heart, uh, and I'm going to focus on American international relations theorists and their forecasting in three cases. The case of German unification and the end of the Cold War, the case of NATO expansion, and the case of the invasion of Iraq by the United States, which occurred 15 years ago yesterday, an example of a disastrous foreign policy decision. And finally, that will conclude. So you all clear on where I'm going? Am I, am I speaking too quickly or am I comprehensible? I know native English speakers are a minority in this room. Okay, very good. Let us start with what is a good forecast? Whoops, excuse me. What is a good forecast? Maybe put it on the tie. Okay, what is a good forecast? The key point about a good forecast, it's not just about being right. It's about being right for the right reasons. So good forecasts have the following characteristics. First, a good forecast is precise enough to know if it's been proven wrong. We need to say something about where events are going that is clear enough that if they don't go that way, we know that our prediction 
or our forecast is wrong. So vague, ambiguous, generalized forecasts are no use to anybody. In addition, the forecast um, uh, needs to not just suggest what is going to happen, but suggest why you think it is going to happen. That is to say, you need to specify not just that I think war will break out in this region, but you have to say war will break out in this region because of certain causal processes, because of certain underlying forces. And that is why what Professor Sushintsov said is so important, without theory. You will not be able to explicate the underlying causes very effectively. So you must have theory as part of your forecast, because a theory is what is telling you the relationship between cause and effect. So that is a crucial part of a forecast. Forecasts that don't tell you the causal mechanism that is generating the expected outcome are useless. Um, so uh, this has a couple of implications. It means that being right for the wrong reasons doesn't count as a forecast. I can give you one example. When I was studying Sovietology back in the day, in the 1980s, there was a famous book by a Soviet immigrant named Andrei Almalrik, which was called, Will the Soviet Union Survive Until 1984? And he forecast the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1980s. And he wrote the book in the 1970s. Genius, right? Except he forecast the Soviet Union, Soviet Union would collapse as a result of a war with China. So this, this forecast does not add any scientific validity to Almalric's theory, and it is not a particularly useful forecast. Um, so being right for the wrong reasons doesn't count. Um, being right after you've been wrong forever also doesn't count. So a famous example for those of you who study Russian Soviet history, uh, Leon uh, Trotsky was kicked out of the Soviet Union. And before Stalin had him killed in Mexico, he predicted the Soviet Union would collapse because of bureaucratic state. And Trotsky and Trotsky's followers for the next 50 years predicted the Soviet Union would collapse, Soviet Union would collapse, Soviet Union would collapse. Every year they predicted it would collapse. Finally it collapsed. Does that mean Trotskyism is right? No, I mean, it's like a clock that has stopped is right twice a day. Trotsky, I, Trotskyists were eventually right, but that doesn't mean their theory was right or their forecast was useful. Um, so being right for the, for being wrong forever and then finally right doesn't count. But being wrong, if you've been right for decades and decades, that is a different story. What if you've been right? What if I'm forecasting every year something and every year I'm right? And every year there are people saying something else. People saying, well, actually, no, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. And I say, no, those things are not going to happen. We're going to see this thing, and I'm right for 50 years. And then finally I'm wrong. How is that for performance? You're 99% accurate. But that is exactly what happened, if I may say so, with realism and the Cold War. Because basically, Kenneth Waltz wrote a theory of realism where he said the Cold War is rooted in bipolarity, the Cold War will last a long time, and all these other people were saying, no, 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 the Cold War is going to end, we're going to have multipolarity, everything's going to change, the world is totally changing. If you look back on the period in which Waltz was saying actually continuity is what matters, and everybody else is saying change is what matters, if you read that stuff, who actually was right in hindsight? Waltz was right in hindsight. He was right year after year after year, and then... In 1989, he was wrong. So what should we say about his theory? His theory was very, very useful for a long time, but it was ultimately wrong. That's very different, I think, than the Trotsky example, where you're wrong every year and then you're right once. Waltz was right every year for a long time, and he was wrong once. I admitted he was wrong in a big way. It's just like, uh, so these are some rules for thinking about forecasts. Um, uh, so, uh, to conclude this first section on what means, uh, what is a good forecast, I would say when you're discussing uh, international relations theory and its role in forecasting, we need to buy, we need to guard against various biases in our analysis, various biases. Now, a well known bias that we need to guard against is the bias of confirmation. The fact that if I support or uh, 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 I am uh, 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 associated with a theory, I'm biased in favor of seeing that theory's forecast as being correct. So that's a bias we need to control against. On the other hand, on the other hand, we need to correct another well-known bias, which is the bias of focusing only on spectacular failures of forecasts and missing the boring everyday successes of forecasts. This is what I would say would be the Waltz example. That you, you focus on the big, big case that he got wrong, namely the end of the Cold War, and fail to realize 
how much he got right. It's just like the field of meteorology forecasting the weather. When the, when the, when the weather man, as we call it, weather person, weather expert, forecasts weather and he's right, he's right. But when he says it's not going to snow and you get a huge snow, everyone notices it. And they tend to think, if you ask a normal person, they tend to think the forecasts are not as good as they actually are. On average, meteorological forecasts are quite good, but we have a bias in favor of noticing when they fail. Okay, so all of that is just to give you some thinking the tools for how to think about forecasts. Now let me move to the second part of my talk, which is to say a little bit about current research in forecasting. Research which has tried very hard to fight against the biases that I just told you about in how to think about forecasting. And um, there's a lot of work that has been going on that is very interesting, very exciting, very technically sophisticated, very heavily funded. And a, probably the best known of these is the uh, Good Judgment Project, which is a huge project led by a psychologist a professor of psychology, Philip Tetlock. It started as a purely academic project, but then was funded by the Intelligence Advanced Research Agents Projects, uh, the, the Intelligence Advanced Research Project Activity, which is a part of the U.S. National Intelligence uh, Council, uh, the Office of National Intelligence. So the U.S. government is behind this thing now. The study employed several thousand people as volunteer forecasters. And I was one of these volunteer forecasters. And every week on your computer, you're asked to make these forecasts and to update the forecast. Thousands of people doing these forecasts. And they poll you to, act, to figure out what are you like as an intellectual. Like, how do you think? How do you reason? And then they measure the success or failure of the forecast. And things would be like, you know, will there be major violence in Ukraine within the next two weeks? Will there be South Sudan? What will happen? There are really serious geopolitical forecasts. They are, tend to be short term, so they're like within the next month or two months. Um, and they can measure using a very, very accurate, and you, you, you have a little bar, you, you're rating percentage likelihood or unlikelihood of various things. So it's very scientific. Thousands of people doing this. And then they measure who is a good forecaster and who's not. They measure relative success. And what emerged from this research is they identified a subclass, a group within the larger group, they call super forecasters. People who are, on average, systematically much better at forecasting than other people. Often 30, 40, 50% better at forecasting than the average forecaster. And by the way, most of the people in this project are the experts, academics, etc. So one of the big things you might want to ask is what were the characteristics of these people who were super forecasters? One thing is they basically understand probability theory. They understand statistics. So they understand what it means to say something is 20% or 30% likely. Actually, that's not very intuitive. Many people don't understand this basic statistics, but I doubt there's anyone in this room who doesn't understand basic probability theory. So you all understand that you need to have a basic understanding of probability theory. But beyond that, what were these people like? Well, Philip Tetlock said that essentially his conclusion was that you can kind of divide people up into two different types. And he followed in this an old famous essay by the political philosopher Isaiah Berlin, who wrote an essay called The Hedgehog and the Fox. The hedgehog is a little animal, a little furry animal that's known for basically being very stubborn, very slow moving, very insistent. And the fox is known as being clever and moving around very quickly. And so the idea was we have two types of minds. We have the hedgehog who knows one thing and knows it really, really well. That's the hedgehog. And the fox knows tons of things. Doesn't know each thing super well, but knows tons of things. And the argument here is that some People who like their theories like them so much that they become like the hedgehog. They know their theory. They love their theory. Their theory is beautiful. So everywhere they look, they see their theory. And he basically argued, and he could know this about people who were part of the Good Judgment Project because they answered these various surveys and questionnaires. So at the end of the day, it turns out foxes systematically are more likely to be super forecasters than hedgehogs. And so the lesson from that is that where theory is necessary for good forecasting, you can't become too attached to your theory to the point that you become a hedgehog. 
So that's the big result that emerges from the recent research on um, on uh, on forecasting in international politics. So is this clear so far? Any questions? Have I said anything that's totally crazy or confusing? <laughs> All right, you're, you're with me then, huh? Okay, then let's move on to some examples because I'm a qualitative guy. I like to look at actual examples instead of just big big numbers. And um, and here, uh, here I want to make a quick point that you might be sitting there saying, well, wait a minute, how important is forecasting in international relations and how frequently do international relations scholars actually make forecasts? How often do you read a paper in international relations and the author says, and now, dear reader, I'm going to make a forecast? In fact, it's pretty rare. And I think it should be much less rare. I think people should do it much more as part of the project that we're working on. But so you might think, well, there aren't that many forecasts. But think about this for a second. Um, do international relations scholars ever, oh, I need to talk into this one? Oh, okay. Do international relations scholars recommend policies? Do they make policy recommendations? Do they say, you know what, the government should do this policy, not that policy? Well, I don't know about the stuff that you read, but what I read, they're constantly making policy recommendations. They say, don't do this, do this. And you have to, if you think about it for a minute, any policy recommendation by an international relations scholar, where the scholar is using the theory to recommend the policy, that is a forecast. Because any policy recommendation is forecasting something, saying, we will be better off if you do this policy than that policy, which is saying, if you don't do what I recommend, this bad thing will happen. If you do do what I recommend, good things will happen. Every policy recommendation is a forecast. And every time any international relations scholar connects her or his theory to a policy recommendation, that scholar is making a <coughs> forecast, which means we, in fact, have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of forecasts we can evaluate and see which kinds of forecasts work well. Clear enough, right? Okay, so let's look at three cases of actual forecasting in international relations. And first, I want to look at the end of the Cold War. Of course, mo almost everybody in this room was born after the end of the Cold War. I read to my absolute shock and horror that about three weeks ago, the date passed on which the Berlin Wall was down longer than it was up. For guys my age, people my age, that's a shocking thing. It's unbelievable. That's how long the Cold War has been. But to me, German unification and the end of the Cold War are like yesterday. I mean, literally. So this event is hard to tell a younger generation how extraordinary, how big, how unexpected the sudden end of the Cold War and the peaceful unification of, the, of Germany, how unlikely that seemed only a year or two before it happened. So let's turn the clock back uh, to the fall, early fall of 1989. We have demonstrations in Leipzig, East Germany. It's very destabilizing. The German, East German government is trying to reform. And the West is trying to figure out what its policy should be. The US and West Germans, French, British, they're all the French side, what should we do? For years, we said we supported German unification, but we didn't really support German unification. We kind of supported the status quo. Um, and uh, suddenly in the fall, Helmut Kohl, the chancellor of West Germany, the Federal Republic of Germany, essentially made a speech in which he said, we're gonna move towards, a 10 point speech, we're moving towards unification of Germany. We're gonna do this thing. And basically everybody was completely shocked. Uh, Thatcher and uh, uh, the British Prime Minister and the French President Francois Mitterrand got together and said, how do we stop this thing? This is crazy. And so you, it's hard from today's vantage to realize how radical the idea was that, yeah, we'll just, we'll just unify Germany despite the Soviet Union, despite the Warsaw Pact, despite the fact we have 500,000 Soviet troops sitting in East Germany, despite the fact that we might have a third world war, despite the fact that we have so many nuclear weapons, that we're on tenterhook, this is dangerous, this is going to harm the prestige and standing of the Soviet Union, how do we know they're going to respond? Cole said we're going to go forward with this. And at that point, it becomes a policy issue where scholars get to weigh in. And you may be surprised to know this, but in fact, Many scholars of international security advise strongly against the policy of rapid unification of Germany. Soon after Cole's speech, George H.W. Bush, the father of the guy who mistakenly invaded Iraq 16 years ago, uh, um, this guy, uh, George H.W. Bush, um, decided to back 
West German ally to the hilt. He said, we're going to go with Helmut. Helmut's right. We're going to, I like, I like Gorby. I like Misha. I like Gorbachev a lot. He's a great guy, but I'm supporting Helmut all the way. We're going to throw ourselves in with our allies and we're going to go for fa fast unification. And scholars, you may be surprised to hear, international relations scholars weighed in on this issue and they weighed in very negatively. They thought it was a bad idea. There was a very brief period in which they strongly advised against it. And what they in fact advised, very interestingly, a scholar by the name of Anne-Marie Burley, who's now named Anne-Marie Slaughter, she wrote an article which was typical of the thinking of the time, which said that the move should be, in fact, the Federal Republic of Germany should recognize the German Democratic Republic, formally recognize it as an independent state, um, which they had never done because they viewed it as illegitimate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that would be a master stroke that would stabilize the, de the, the scary situation in Europe. Um, why were international relations scholars opposed? Why did they oppose this? Why did they oppose it? They opposed it because they forecast that a rapid move towards unification was extremely dangerous and indeed would likely bring about war. And they did so for the following reasons. First, their theories associated rapid decline of states with war. And they worried that the Soviet Union, if it was declining too rapidly, if it were pushed back too fast, would, would, would unleash preventive war. They had statistical evidence for this, because this is what most states do. Of course, most of that evidence, of course, came from a pre-nuclear era before nuclear weapons. Uh, but there was a tendency for the scholars in their minds, their theories associated rapid change, rapid change that affects the status and security of great powers. They associated that in their minds with war. And they thought, we can't do this so fast. We are risking major war. And indeed, uh, major rivalries, and the Cold War was certainly a great power rivalry, there's only one prolonged great power rivalry that began and ended without a direct war between the two protagonists, and that was the U.S. and the Soviet Union in the Cold War. So they had on their side history, they had on their side theory, they had on their side evidence, all leading them to be scared. In addition, how many people have ever read in this room an article by John Mearsheimer called Back to the Future? Instability after the Cold War. It's a famous article. It's been cited a lot more than this article that Andre uh, referred to that I wrote. It wasn't a syllabus. <laughs> ah, this is a. You didn't think you were coming in here for a test. All right, everybody, take out your pencils. No, the um, the uh, article Back to the Future basically said that bipolarity, the split of Europe, was a factor of stability, and that if bipolarity ended, we would have war. So that in some sense. There was a policy recommendation in John Mearsheimer's article, and you'd be surprised to hear what that is. It was we should prop up the Warsaw Pact. We should help the Warsaw Pact. We should help the members of the Warsaw Treaty Organization so that they don't too rapidly decline, so we can preserve bipolarity. Because if we don't preserve bipolarity in Europe, we're going to get war. So these were two associated, connected reasons why international relations scholars forecast um, uh, very bad things would happen if Germany unified too quickly. So that was their policy recommendation and that was their forecast. Um, so how did this forecast do in hindsight? Not very well. Because the idea was that sometime in the policy relevant future, policy relevant future, there would be military conflict about the unification of Germany and the end of the Cold War and in fact there wasn't. So that prediction doesn't turn out so well. And that prediction came straight out of their theories. So that's the first example. Now we can talk, we'll save the questions, when we do questions and answers. Maybe you disagree with this. Maybe you think that's a good prediction. My view as someone who actually was sympathetic to that view is I don't think it was a very good prediction. So that's the first case. The second case follows directly from this first case. The second case is NATO expansion. Expansion of NATO in, the, in basically the years between 1980, uh, 1994 and 1999. But the key thing here is that NATO expansion is really almost an extension of this first case of German unification. Because when I mentioned German unification, I failed to say you know, more detail about it. What, what, what was this German unification? What was, the, what was the nature of it? And of course, as you all know, German unification took place within the NATO alliance. Uh, within the NATO alliance, that the NATO alliance would remain the fundamental institutional basis for the U.S. presence in Europe.
And the American uh, leadership, George H.W. Bush, his national security advisor, Brent Scowcroft, were adamant that we could not sacrifice NATO. NATO was a necessary condition of the U.S. presence in Europe, and the U.S. presence in Europe was a necessary condition of peace and stability in Europe. And so they insisted not only on German unity, but on German unity within NATO. And that is why George H.W. Bush was so quick to support Helmut Kohl. Because he knew if he didn't support him wholeheartedly, Kohl may well have said, well, I don't need NATO then. I would rather have German unity than NATO. And so the policy was about keeping the alliance, keeping the ally, um, and, and keeping the US and Europe. All these things were thought to be absolutely necessary. Scholarly opinion among international relations scholars was strongly opposed to this basic idea. Most international security scholars did not believe that it was a good idea to maintain NATO. In fact, they thought NATO was probably doomed anyway, because NATO only reason for existing was to balance against the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was gone. Why do we need this thing? But also it was because most scholars believed that we need to create a new security architecture in Europe. They, they, they thought it was a good idea for the U.S. to stay in Europe, maybe not with oh, as many troops, but to stay in Europe. But they wanted it to be with a new, a new security architecture that would include Russia. Because most of these scholars thought that the most important question for the post-Cold War world, based on their realist theory and their understanding of history, was the most important question for the post-Cold War. More important, quite honestly, and many of you may not like this, but this is the way they thought, more important than Hungary, more important than Czechoslovakia, more important than Poland, the most important question they thought was Russia, was can we solve the Russia problem? Can we get Russia involved in a amicable, cooperative, institutional security architecture. And so they were very opposed to the idea of insisting on German unity within NATO, and they were very opposed to the idea of NATO expansion itself. Um, and so um, the policy recommendation of these scholars was, don't do this. Don't do this thing. And instead, be open to the idea of a new security architecture. And it's fascinating to read the archival documents of the Bush administration. They thought about this, but they rejected it. Mainly, interestingly, not out of a sense of expansionism, aggression. They literally were afraid. They were very afraid. They all made the analogy to the post-World War II period. They thought that if the US got rid of NATO, that would open up all kinds of instability, all kinds of uncertainty, all kinds of potential for conflict. They literally did seem, at least as far as the archival documents are to, be, are to be believed, they really did believe this. In their minds, they thought they could reconcile this with the <coughs> Russian issue. They, in their minds, they thought they could integrate Russia somehow, but we'll deal with that later. Today, let's deal with the NATO thing. And um, uh, also, quite honestly, they thought Russia was weak. So they knew Russia couldn't do anything about it. That was an important factor. And so, uh, so this was a case of a prediction. And the prediction was, if you do this thing, it's going to be bad, and you shouldn't do this thing. My international relations expertise, these scholars were saying, is telling us that you should not expand NATO. Um, and so what specifically was that what, what, what sort of forecasts was that policy recommendation based on? Well, first of it was balance of power theory. It was that Russia, if Russia is, if Russia is faced with strengthening alliance that is expanding on its border, it's going to balance back. That's what all of international relations theory tells us, according to these people. And uh, as John Lewis Gaddis, who's a historian but steeped in international relations theory, John Lewis Gaddis put it uh, in a quote uh, 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 simply, if country A feels threatened by country B, it is apt to align itself with country C. And who was country C? China was country C. So basically these realists were saying, if you do this thing, you're going to create a big Eurasian balance against the United States. And you don't want that to happen, so you shouldn't do it. Pardon? Yeah, well, that, that's what we're going we're gonna to discuss. The second uh, projected cost of NATO expansion, uh, according to these, the forecast was, the forecast was that this is going to be too expensive. Um, you can't really defend these countries. Paul Kennedy, another historian steeped in international relations theory, wrote an opinion piece in the New York Times that was called, Let's See the Pentagon's Plan for Defending Poland. 
Remember, this is writing in like 1994, when we were considering Poland for membership of NATO. You could just replace in that Estonia instead of Poland. What's the plan? How are you going to defend Estonia? In fact, there never was a plan. And there still today is not a credible plan for defending Estonia. So basically, you have this problem of cost. It's very expensive to do this thing. And you don't, you don't, you're, you're cutting your defense budget. The U.S. dramatically cut its defense budget after the Cold War. Really big cuts. Pulled lots of troops out of Europe. So what kind of alliance is this if you don't have a credible defense and you can't afford a credible defense? That's the second prediction. The third prediction was here we are moving out of international relations theory to the area of kind of area experts and political scientists comparative politics. But the third projected cost was democracy in Russia. Basically, specialists on international relations and on democracy said, and on Russian politics, all said, they all converged on the forecast that NATO expansion would be a major blow to any hopes for Russian Democrats. And it would serve as a mobilizing spur to nationalist and authoritarian forces. So if you want Russia to be a democracy, which you say you do, then don't expand an alliance in its face. Basically, it goes without saying, we know threat from the outside increases push for authoritarianism. And I can show you the quotes, I can show you the articles that said all of these things. Again, we can debate whether that's correct, but that was their forecast. And a final important forecast, and here's a trick with forecasting, because sometimes the forecast is counterfactual. In other words, we don't know what would have happened had you followed the policy advice. But their policy advice suggested a big gain. So in other words, the first three forecasts are about cost. You, if you do this policy of narrow expansion, you will pay costs in these three ways. The fourth forecast here was about gains. Namely, if you, if you expand NATO, you will miss big gains on the upside. And those gains essentially are the um, uh, a st stable post-Cold War settlement. Scholars were very, very aware from their theory and history that the settlements of the previous major wars, World Wars I and II, were unstable, problematic settlements. Versailles Treaty did not deal with the problem of Germany and Japan as revisionist powers. The post-World uh, post War II settlement never solved the German question and led to the Cold War. So they were saying, don't make this mistake again. We need to make a settlement of this war, the Cold War, that is a stable settlement, that has a concert of great powers, that has legitimacy, that has stability. And so you may be thinking about the immediate gains that you get next week, next month, maybe even next year from expanding NATO. You'll get gains. But you forget about the cost you will pay or the unrealized benefits you will miss a decade from now, two decades from now, when you will not have a stable post-Cold War settlement, when you will have created a revisionist power in your midst, and you will create problems for yourself down the road. Again, you can read these texts absolutely clearly, and they make this forecast absolutely unambiguously. Um, so this was the forecasting. And um, uh, where, what do we think about these forecasts? Were they right or were they wrong? Most people, I think, I saw a lot of nodding heads. People think at least some of these forecasts were right. I think it's a very interesting question. Are they right? I think it takes research, actually, to turn out where they're right. Because they were actually wrong in the near term, which is what most policymakers care about. Most policymakers care about next year, maybe two years from now. Most policymakers, leaders, aren't thinking about 10, 20 years from now. Anything can happen then. And the projected costs actually did not happen right away. At first, it seemed like, yes, in fact, we can afford this. At first, it seemed like, no, Russia's not balancing. At first, it seemed like, yeah, democracy seems to be kind of doing okay in Russia. I mean, it's not perfect, but what do you expect? It's going to take a while. And at first, it seemed as if we might actually get these gains of cooperation. That we'll cooperate in the UN. Russia's having some problems, maybe, with its domestic politics, but ultimately, it's going to be fine. So for about 10 years, or at least, some people would say until 2000, around the Rock War, everything seemed to be not corresponding to these predictions. And in particular, many people in this room will know, after the September 11th attack on the United States, Vladimir Putin was the first foreign leader to express a sympathy in a phone call to President George Bush, expressed desire to cooperate, there was cooperation. If the U.S. had, you have to ask yourself counterfactually, if the U.S. had, instead of doing what it did, which is abrogate the ABM Treaty and a lot of other things, if it had actually met Putin halfway, in 2001, would we be in the same place we are today? So we need to ask whether those forecasts 
were actually right, or are they just sort of right now? But in other words, I think it's a research question. I don't know yet. In fact, we're talking about possibly doing a paper along these lines in this project. So anyway, that's something for the Q&A if you're interested. Uh, I uh, have to say that I have confirmation bias. Here I will make this personal. I, of course, was part of this group. I strongly opposed NATO expansion. I did so based on theory, mostly. And I was involved in all of these things. And I, 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 wasn't, I was a small young assistant professor. Nobody invited me to testify before Congress like they invited Paul Kennedy and John Gaddis. But I was strongly in favor of all of these arguments. And so I, my bias is to believe these forecasts were all correct. But I think it's actually a research question. OK, we're, we're, we uh, need to uh, move forward expeditiously. So let me quickly mention uh, the most tragic one in some ways. I don't know what's the most tragic one. But the invasion of Iraq 15 years. Oh, and let me back up. Sorry. What were these forecasts like? It's an interesting thing. What were these forecasts like? Yes, they were theoretically informed, these forecasts made about NATO expansion. But they were also all made by people who were deeply familiar with history and deeply familiar with the dynamics and peculiarities and specifics of the Cold War. So these were people who were fox-like. They were like those foxes in the sense that they were combining their theory with granular, detailed, specific knowledge of the specifics of the case they were making their forecast about, namely the Cold War and the US-Soviet relations. So I would categorize that forecast as belonging in the category of the intellectual space, even though it was heavily informed by theory, of this sort of more of a Fox type of theoretical prediction. Finally, let's look at the invasion of Iraq. 15 years ago yesterday, the United States invaded Iraq. And this is a case of unambiguously, overwhelmingly, uh, US uh, international relations scholars uh, oppose this. They, not just realist scholars, but scholars from all sorts of different theoretical perspectives. However, it's interesting. And here, if you really look deeply, you'll find that uh, there was some hedging. You know, some of the liberal international type scholars said, well, I oppose it if you don't have the UN Security Council resolution supporting the invasion. But if you do have a Security Council resolution, then I support it. And some very famous scholars, including, yes, the same, very one and the same, Anne-Marie Slaughter, was in favor of the invasion, even though she's an international lawyer, even without a UN Security Council resolution. So some liberal scholars were for it. Um, a few realist scholars were for it. Very few, a small number of realist scholars. But of course, they had a realist view, uh, which was invade, Get rid, of, get rid of Saddam Hussein and put another Sunni dictator on his place, forget about democratization, run the place with another dictator, everything will be great. Uh, but that, of course, is not what we did. We overthrew the dictator, we overthrew the Ba'athist party, we destroyed the entire state, and then we got what we got. Um, but actually, the, most, the earliest, most visible, most articulate opponents, earliest, were realists. Because they not only imposed the invasion, they imposed the threat of the invasion. Because they were smart enough to know that once you say to Iraq, either open up your country to intrusive inspections everywhere, or we will invade you. Once you are in the realm of coercive diplomacy, threatening force, you're already going to have a high likelihood of a war. And therefore, the realists not only opposed the invasion, they imposed the course of diplomacy. And they supported an alternative policy, containment and deterrence. So they were the most thorough, clear, and early opponents to the invasion of Iraq. There was a letter signed by 800 security scholars. I've, I'm on there, some little unimportant name of this letter of 800 scholars opposing the invasion of Iraq. Um, so they said it was going to be a disaster. Um, so what did they say? What were their forecasts? Very quickly, almost done with the talk, folks. What, would, what was their prediction? First of all, their prediction was that a policy of deterrence and containment would work. And the reason it would work is because Saddam Hussein was rational. He was detestable but deterrable. In other words, the idea was that what you may not realize is that the main debate in the night, in the, in the, before the invasion of Iraq was, is Saddam Hussein actually rational? This is the same debate people have about Kim Il-sung, ah, uh, Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-un. Because basically the case for the invasion was, he's undeterrable, he's crazy, he'll do anything, he's a maniac. And we've forgotten about this debate, but that was the main debate. And John Mearsheimer, 
And Stephen Walt, who wrote the most detailed op oppositional articles to the invasion, most of their articles proving to you that Saddam Hussein was actually rational. It's very hard to remember this, but that's what the main debate was about. So his argument, their argument was a policy of deterrence will work because Hussein is a bastard, but he's a rational bastard. <laughs> the second one was that war would be costly in blood and treasure and probably spread instability in the region, ultimately harming U.S. interests. But you have to wait a second here and think. There's actually two parts of this war. One is the war to defeat Saddam Hussein. And the second is what comes afterwards. So the first argument was the war to defeat Saddam Hussein might be quite difficult. This, the third argument they made was that even if you win easily against Saddam Hussein, there was no exit strategy. That is, the Kurdish problem, the Shia versus Sunni problem are potentially explosive, raising the risks of a protracted insurgency, regional involvement in Iraqi civil war, the prevention of which would require prolonged and costly <coughs> U.S. occupation. That was their third forecast. And the fourth forecast was that war with Iraq would jeopardize the campaign against the real enemy, which is Al-Qaeda, by diverting material, resource, material resources and inflaming anti-Americanism precisely in the region most vulnerable to this kind of provocation by external intervention. Indeed, many scholars warn that invading uh, a, uh, and occupying an Arab country would only increase the problem of terror fired, increased uh, anger and resentment. So what do you think about that forecast? That was a pretty damn good forecast, I gotta say. In almost every particular is right. The only point where it was a little bit wrong was on the cost of the actual invasion, which was very much easier than many people expected. They, they, Saddam did not use chemical weapons. He did not uh, bomb Israel. They didn't, uh, they didn't escalate the actual war. But three of those four forecasts were not just accurate, they're uncannily accurate. They predict exactly what happened. So that was what I call a policy recommendation that's very, 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 based on a very strong forecast. Um, so, where do we, where do we conclude uh, about the basis of this forecast? The interesting thing about the forecast is you may have noticed there's, very, there's not a lot of realist theory in there. Sure, realism assumes that most states are rational, most actors are rational. So that was consistent with the theory. And realism, because of the rationality assumption, assumes that containment and deterrence would work. And realism also has within it this whole theory about basically group identity, which makes it very averse to the idea of breaking up states. Like if you have a government, don't smash it up, especially when there are defined political communities who are antagonistic. This is the basic anarchy argument, okay? That you invade the country, you create anarchy, the groups then become actors, and then they face the same problem of anarchy as states do, and you have a problem. So there's theory in it, but it is not a didactic or dogmatic application of theory, and in fact, much of it is based on regional expertise and careful policy analysis. So that one, too, I would put in the column of Fox-type analysis. All right, well, I've talked for quite a long time, and I think I have now given you a general, um, a general uh, introduction to how to think about forecasts. I've told you about recent research on forecasts and how Fox outperform hedgehogs, and I've told you three examples from the actual history of U.S., mainly international relations scholars, making those forecasts, and I've suggested those three cases kind of suggest that theory is important, but you need to be careful and non-dogmatic in your application of theory. And so to conclude, let me just make quickly three points, but it'll be super quick, a sentence each. First, remember, I think there are more good forecasts in international relations than people get credit for because there are many boring everyday forecasts that are right that people don't remember. I think that people um, who are overly committed, overly partisan to a theory may stumble, may be slow to update their assumptions in revolutionary times. And the third point is that evaluating forecasts in an unbiased way is hard. And I believe there's a lot more good work to be done in evaluating these forecasts. And I hope, together with Andre and his colleagues, to be doing a little bit of that work. So thank you very much for your forbearance for this talk. Thank you, Bill, for the excellent talk. And I see a lot of hands with the question one.
Please introduce yourself. Okay, my name is Josef Rabina. I'm a PhD student here at Timo. And uh, you are originally from? Uh, from, from Slovakia. Uh, I'm working with a hegemonic war and major conflict uh, during this maybe redistribution of power. And I would like to ask you what you think about the uh, theory of rationality of actors and MAD, MAD logic in a system. How it's going to affect uh, hegemonic war in the future? And uh, for example, I wrote a paper on it. And I think maybe I just concluded from your, from your, uh, from your speech today that deterrence, so counterbalancing, will prevent the states from doing major conflict. Three questions per take. Okay. Is it clear? Okay. okay uh, let, yes. Uh, Adrian. Um, well, my name is Adrian. I'm a master student here. Uh, you talked about statistics at the beginning, so I have two questions. Uh, first of all, from what do you create statistics? How do you come up with numbers out of events? And the second question is, uh, is there any specific type of events uh, in which uh, using statistics is relevant? Thank you. Questions? Uh, okay, national balance. Alex. Okay, so I actually will have a follow-up question and it's uh, not more about theory, but about your personal opinion on two separate cases. Okay, if we take the case which is valid after the Napoleonic Wars when the France was uh, 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 keep kept her power of a great power when there were no strict limitations in, uh, on the French power and almost no revisionism, like imperial revi revisionism in France after the uh, uh, Napoleonic Napoleon. Wars. Uh, why it was made like this and uh, in that case, why the Russia was uh, not uh, led to maintain her great power potential the way as France had after the fall of the Soviet Union? So those are three questions. First, I think it's mainly about mutually assured destruction and power transition or hegemonic war theory. Yeah. So I think that um, uh, this is the great uh, debate of, uh, of the 21st century, uh, but which is whether the logic of deterrence, nuclear deterrence, outweighs the logic of preventive war and power transition. We already had a little bit of this in the case that I discussed, the Cold War, uh, in that, uh, again, the only prolonged rivalry to end with no major war between the rivals. Uh, and um, there are many reasons for this. Gorbachev factor, many of you may have read histories or memoirs of this period of new political thinking, perestroika. Gorbachev had very idealistic notions. However, in the background, I think uh, he still had a general staff and he still had serious military people. And those people could take comfort in the fact that if we're losing some territory, if we're losing some allies, we still have a gigantic nuclear arsenal which is going to de deter anyone from existential threats against the Soviet Union. So the ultimate threat to the Soviet Union did not come from American power, it came from the contradictions within the country uh, in terms of nationalities and economic decline, and you might say problematic leadership. So, um, uh, so I think that's the big debate. But the problem is that things are changing now. Uh, and both uh, countries, the U.S. and Russia, are exploring doctrines that uh, lower thresholds. My country uh, in initiated a nuclear posture review. It suggests somehow that somehow low yield nuclears are going to enhance the terms. I personally believe it's crazy. Um, so the question is whether how stable that dominance of MAD over preventive war logic is. I still think it is, because I ultimately think rationality prevails. I think when the existential moment comes, and you're deciding whether to push the little bit over that line, the minute you think nuclear use is credible, you're going to stop. So is it? No. Oh, so on statistics, on statistics, in this, in this, in this, um, in this presentation, I was only talking about the only statistics I was referring to was the statistics of percentage right of forecasts. And you ask whether events can be made statistically, uh, put, put into numbers. The key is that all in that good judgment project, which again, I'm a part of it, but only as a forecaster, a low level participant. I have no role in the leadership of the project. Everything you forecast is numerical. In other words, every forecast you're asked to make is unambiguous, whether it will happen in a given time frame. And then you're asked to put estimate the probability that will happen within a given time frame. And so that is very easy to translate into a statistic called a Breyer score, which is basically accuracy over the long term of your forecast. So that's the only statistic I referred to.
Though that I think is legitimate. I think there's lots of things where people attempt to translate the, the complex tapestry of international politics into, into numbers where it's problematic. But in that particular case, I think they do a fairly rigor, they do a reasonable job. Yeah, so that limits the kinds of testing you can do to events that are going to happen or not happen within a certain time frame. So when I'm making a forecast about like Ukraine or if I'm making a forecast about Sudan or making a forecast about Zimbabwe, it's always within a time frame. So if I don't think the thing is gonna happen, if I think the probability is very low that it's gonna happen within say two years, I put a probability number and if two years go by and that thing has not happened, they then assess my, my forecast. Make sense? So regarding Versailles, I mean, exactly. The Versailles settlement and the concert of Europe is what all of these scholars had in their mind. Obviously, they knew this is a new era. We can't make naive comparisons to great power politics of the early 19th century. But basically, they regarded that as a model kind of settlement of a major war where all of the, com all of the former combatants, all the former rivals are included in a new order. And the order, given how volatile uh, it could have been, the order proved relatively stable. Really, some think until the end of the 19th century, but at least until the Crimean War. So that, why was Russia not included? It's because these, I believe, personally, I, by the way, I have a very high regard for the Bush administration, uh, the first one. Uh, I like them, I voted for the guy. Um, and, uh, but I think they were thinking short term. You know, we'll solve, like, today let's deal with this, and then tomorrow let's deal with Russia. Like, we can deal with Russia tomorrow. Um, and they didn't want to face the tough trade-offs and the difficult diplomacy that would have been required to get rid of NATO. And here, the difference is, from Versailles, from Concert of Europe, is that there they had no legacy institutions. They didn't have the baggage of previous existing institutions. In this case, you end the Cold War, and there's this beautiful institution, NATO, sitting right there. It's very hard to ask politicians to destroy an institution that works. The basic conservatism of politics is, if I've got something that works, you know the old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it's working, keep it, because it's hard to build institutions. It's easy to destroy institutions. So the basic conservatism of Scowcroft and Bush said, I have a bird in the hand, which is NATO. I am not going to risk it just out of the hope that maybe in the future I will have a beautiful new relationship with Russia. So that's, I think, the main explanation why Russia was excluded from the post-Cold War settlement. So this suggests, actually, I'm thinking, uh, this online, this suggests that it would probably be better for us to actually have a war at the end of the Cold War, for Russia to be you know, included, to have a Versailles, and to have everybody addressing the concern of Russian security. Um, yeah, well, uh, nothing would be worth a war between the United States and the Soviet Union. No. But what if you had had some breakdown of, I mean, what if you'd had, you would have had to have had some, sim the problem with the end of the Cold War is it's simply asymmetrical. Let's face it, one side basically collapsed. Commun the Soviet type systems collapsed. And it makes it very hard for the winner Again, they win because the other side, it's very hard for the winner to say, well, okay, I'm going to also throw away all my stuff. I'm going to get rid of my institutions. Your, your Warsaw Pact collapse, okay, I'll get rid of mine. So the only way to have made the end of the Cold War symmetrical without a war would be if there had been some sort of societal collapse or NATO collapse, like nationalist parties come to power in France and Britain or Germany. Something would have, the, one way, some of my Soviet, for back in time it was still Soviet Union, some of my Soviet friends who studied international relations, they were realists. They had to be secret realists, because you weren't allowed to be a real realist of the Soviet Union. You had to sort of pretend to be Marxist-Leninist, but they were basically realists. And they said Gorbachev made a huge error. What he should have done was accept unification only on the condition of no NATO. And that would have created a contradiction between the German national feeling and the NATO alliance. And then you may have leveraged a crisis within NATO, and then if that had happened, you would have had a more level playing field. Still, Russia would have been materially weak, but there wouldn't have been this institutional legacy, and you wouldn't probably have had a war. Okay, I see one, two, three. Uh, Nikita. Yes. Uh, so my name is Nikita. Um, uh, the question is, uh, what there, there may be 
any tiredness of uh, making those routine forecasts which you were talking about. Uh, namely, the idea is that uh, before the year 2009, uh, the American administration was making certain forecasts on exporting democracy to the uh, to Middle East. And in 2009, there was Cairo speech by Barack Obama, and namely, he, uh, well, he pushed away from all those ideas of exporting democracy and basically left all those things alone in the Middle East. And then, just in two years, in 2011, Egypt saw this uprise, this social turmoil, and basically uh, it was the pinnacle of the dream of the United States in terms of exporting democracy to the Middle East. So how did that happen? Uh, why there was no prediction of that? Uh, from the side of the United you mean prediction of the Arab Spring or prediction of the prediction of the implication of the Arab Spring in, in Egypt? Yeah. The Arab Spring hype. Um, please. So wait a minute, just to be clear, are you saying that the Cairo speech may have instigated these these things, and so he should have realized when he made the Cairo speech that that might generate? I mean that. I mean that before Cairo speech, there could have been some suggestions that uh, the export of democracy by the United States to the Arab countries may somehow succeed. Right. But in two thousand nine. They basically pushed away from all itself because, well, they, they basically stated that, uh, well, they had nothing more to do with exporting democracy to the Middle East. Right. So, yeah. Thank you. Please. Um, I'm Carlotta. Uh, we talk about the past, about NATO, and what could have been happened, and so on. I am curious to know what is your forecast? I mean, uh, NATO cannot be destroyed, and at the same time, it's not really welcoming by Russia. So what will be happen? What will happen for you? Your program? To NATO? Yeah. Okay. Quite a question. Uh, please. Uh, hello, uh, Professor Robos. My name is Kim Bingo, and uh, I'm a PhD student here in Bingo, and I'm from South Korea. So basically, I have two very quick questions for you. So first one is how to recommend you, uh, how to recommend uh, 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 us to capture the both sides of actor level and structural level uh, kind of interactions for better forecasting of future regions. So, because right now, constructivist argument, such interactions are very important for better understanding of future regions because many theories just focus on the like the, the similarity of actors and the system itself. So, how do you recommend us to like, you know, study the this field or complexity? More complexly, and the second one is about uh, <coughs> focusing about the China, the rise of China and the rise of the Asian region. Do you think that the existing model for forecasting is uh, complete, not completely, but um, kind of generally applicable to, to forecast uh, such a kind of change in international relations, uh, right, uh, which are made by China or Asian countries, or they are kind of anomalies? Which requires us to find some kinds of alternative properties to understand those things. Is it clear? When, when it yeah, I think so. Yep. Okay, the question about uh, the Arab Spring hype, when the NATO would collapse, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the question about the China and North Korea. So, with the Arab Spring, um, the um, uh, uh, the United States, as you know, for so many years was very cozy with various non-democratic dictatorships, and um, one of the and um, the difficulty is forecast is when a politician, when a states person, when a government makes a policy, it is often very difficult to prepare and commit yourself to how you will act under given certain contingencies. Like, what will I do if something that I don't foresee happening actually happens? And so it's very hard to commit to that in advance. And so that's why you sometimes get inconsistency, where somebody will say, well, this is our policy, but then this thing happens, some revolution, a state breakdown, and then they do the thing that they said they weren't going to do. Uh, so that's what I think is basically happening with the Arab Spring. The important thing to recognize is the U.S. was under intense pressure uh, during the Cairo, during the Egypt part of the Arab Spring. Uh, to dump Hosni Mubarak way earlier than we did. And in fact, B Obama really got it from both sides with that one. He got killed for hanging on and supporting Ob uh, Barack, uh, uh, Mubarak as long as he did. Then he finally abandons uh, him and he gets killed for doing that. I honestly really would like to know the brilliant statesman who, who without the benefit of hindsight, could have 
manage that situation better. On the Libya intervention, we know he did not want to do it. That's the best case of allies pulling you into something. The, the thing we call entrapment, which is when you have allies, sometimes the allies kind of entice you into behavior that you're not intending to do, but you do it in order to hold the alliance together. We have pretty good evidence from the Obama administration. It was very, he was very, very reluctant on uh, Qaddafi and on uh, Libya. And so that one was one where he kind of went against his better judgment. They should have been able to forecast what was going to happen if you destroy this government of Libya. And, and many people who are experts on the country did. So I think your first question is theoretical eclecticism. It's basically saying that it's no benefit in a kind of hedgehog-like an insistence that when you're making a forecast, the only thing you will bear in mind is your preferred theory. Particularly if your theory is one that highlights only material structures and doesn't pay attention to ideas and identities and perceptions, which is very, very important. And here again, I think that's absolutely right. I will say that this branch or sub-school of realism that Andre, that uh, Professor Sushinsov referred to, namely neoclassical realism, tries to bring in non-material, ideational uh, uh, factors and domestic ones, but tries to do so in a kind of disciplined way, where we say, okay, it, we're now going to relax this assumption and do this. In other words, they try to make it clear what they're doing, instead of just jumbling everything together. So I kind of a partisan of that, but I, I don't disagree with the idea that good forecasts require theoretical uh, eclecticisms. Uh, and then uh, the second question had to do with East, with the Asia Pacific, and whether the Asia Pacific require whether we can we need to update our models and theories to make forecasts there. And I think that's absolutely the case. And and again, in the cases that I gave you, I think the best forecasts were made by people who were theoretically self-aware, but were willing to update the theory to account for novel factors. So I think, for example, that the first one I gave you, the German unification, their forecast would have been better if they had updated the classical theories with information about the nuclear revolution, about the nature of Gorbachev's reforms, and so on and so forth. And so I think when it comes to East Asia, the same thing goes. We cannot myopically uh, uh, apply uh, power transition theory to the rise of China without considering all kinds of contemporary factors. However, a contemporary new conditions that did not exist when these theories were written and tested. However, the theory is pointing to some real issues that if you don't include in your forecast, they will be, you, they will be problematic. I mean, everyone recognizes that there's something going on with rise and decline, and these countries face incentives to try to solve problems while they can. And so these things are real. Uh, they just need to be updated with information about the peculiarities of the current situation. To give you a clear example, it is very different when the two, the two rival powers are separated by a huge ocean, and when the whole thing is much more maritime focused and air power focused than the US Soviet Central European Front. Very di just right on the geopolitical military side, things are quite different, US China rivalry than the US Soviet rivalry was. Regarding the future of NATO, uh, of course, I, if I would love to, that would be a great idea for a paper that we could do to forecast the future of NATO. The NATO, there were many forecasts of NATO made in the 1990s by realists. All of them turned out to be wrong because all of these realist forecasts that NATO would collapse. Now, um, there's an interesting here. I don't want to be trying to rescue the theory, but the thing is that NATO kind of did collapse in a weird way in that NATO transitioned itself into a different type of alliance. From a balancing alliance into basically kind of like a liberal global stability alliance. I mean, basically NATO during the 1990s and 2000s, the first decade of 2000s, NATO really wasn't about territorial defense and deterrence of Russia. It really was mainly about global stability, counterterrorism, democracy, things like it. Libya. Libya was a NATO operation. The famous, lovely, fabulous case, I'm just joking here, of, of, of Balkan interventions, especially Kosovo. That was a NATO operation that bombed Serbia. Um, so NATO was thought of as this kind of stability thing, it, kind of a management of global politics alliance, rather than a traditional alliance. So you kind of 
might argue that the realists weren't a hundred percent wrong and that yes nato survived as a institution but it was totally different and now we have to ask ourselves what is happening to nato because nato 2.0 was this global security operation and now we have nato 3.0 and nato 3.0 is going to go back to being a deterrence containment alliance against the soviet union against russia and except now it has 20 christ i have i've lost count 26 how many people in how many countries in nato now 29 29, 29. It is not easy to make a coherent alliance with that many people. So I don't know. I would want to sit down and make a coherent forecast. But my, I'm very, I'm, a, I'm nervous about NATO's capacity to generate a credible uh, deterrence alliance with that many members, with that much diversity, and especially if Russia really gets serious. I don't think Russia currently is thinking about any kind of classical territorial operation against NATO. So NATO can kind of exist in the meantime. But if they really had the task, I don't know. So anyway, that's a tough question because I would, if I want to make a forecast, I really want to work on it and think about it. Um, but I'm, 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 I'm wondering how we can get to NATO 3.0. We're not there yet. We're at like 2.2. And we got to get to 3, which is a real defense alliance. But that is, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. OK, guys. So Bill didn't give us a clear deadline when the data would collapse. Uh, so kind of yeah, I know. I started to disappoint you. Sorry, yeah, we're sorry too, in this respect. We uh, have a few moments yet, but I think that we would adjourn now, and uh, I would give uh, Bill you. Uh, I would give Bill to you for ten minutes for those who want to make uh, specific questions out of, outside of this room. So let us uh, uh, thank uh, Professor Wolford for making it, and it was a great discussion, and uh, I really cherish an opportunity for all of us to have this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you.